Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners, macabre murders and captivating crimes from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the desert Pitel. And it's episode 173. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> I wasn't sure there. Hey. 173, we yes. are back. We are back, people. God, we are. From our long, long, long break of two weeks. Could have been longer. Could have been longer <laughs> every time. Every break could have been so much longer. We can't have a long break because they'll be rioting in the streets. Yes, absolutely. To keep us off air. <laughs> People said celebrating a new, street parties. A new utopia has formed. They finally shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. We're back because you know at least one of you wants us to do this. <laughs> at least one is. There's one person in the world. <laughs> I this really weird intrusive thought there. I wonder if the one person who wants us to keep doing it is the zodiac killer i don't know why that came into that's, my head yeah that's entirely <laughs> it's like what if one of them was like a really weird serial killer that no one knows about i'm terrified about how your brain got there to be honest. <laughs> I, I'm just, like... I mean if the zodiac killer is listening you, you've done terrible things oh, do I... the right thing we as the poisonous cabinet if you do listen to us please please turn yourself in okay move on move on <laughs> How are you, Nick? I'm fine. You're fine. Fine. Come on. <laughs> You're fine. What 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 have you got on this evening? So many things. What have you got to There's get back to? Telly to be watched. There's sitting to be done. What are you watching on telly? I've got I've got a very exciting Wheel of new episode of Wheel of Time. I haven't watched. Oh, you're watching Wheel of Time. I thought yeah. you were going to say Wheel of Fortune. Wheel there. of Fortune. <laughs> like, oh, yes, Wheel with the little of, buttered popcorn. Wheel, Wheel of Fortune. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you're Taking stuck here. The telly. <laughs> you're stuck here listening about murder and poison and all manner of things. Fine. But it'll be worth it. Will it? Oh, okay. Well, you set yourself up there. I'm fine, by the way. I'm well. I'm glad. <laughs> That's good. Good to hear. <laughs> I had a lovely holiday. Sunning yourself in the delights of Kuish. 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 That's how the locals say it. Yes. Very fans. <laughs> Trying to learn Croatian is not easy. I can imagine. Did you try? Yes, of course I tried because I think it's polite and let her say good morning and thank you and please but it is the place the eddie is odd joke of you go there and say uh, is english okay and they go yes <laughs> obviously obviously <laughs> yes it was lovely. any poisonings this week uh, I think so. that you know of no no i've, I've got the habit of checking so wise. i've been sort of yeah i've not been i've not been checking for the past couple of weeks i've been mm. i mean so it could be murders of plenty all over the place people getting into your stash switched off my the poisony radar. <laughs> the people of Canterbury have been <laughs> left, left to fend for themselves. Exactly. And I'm, not, I'm not there to protect them anymore. <laughs> Once in every generation, a hero rises and then gets a bit lazy and bored like, nah. <laughs> and then finds a really good TV show he likes. <laughs> well, speaking of not really knowing who's being poisoned around you, but being fabulous while you do it, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. We certainly should have. We've got a few after our... Um, Extensive holidays. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much to Susie D. To Megan Crump. Uh, to Schrodinger. To Charles Jones. Or Charles Jones, maybe. Naomi Sulowitz. To Grant. To Capes. To Scarlet Jigsaw. Princess A.D. And to Julia Rose. Marvellous. Marvellous, sexy, sexy Patreon subscribers. Very much. You've, uh, you've had fun on Patreon. Uh, because while we've been off, obviously, we still put out Patreon content. We had a very, very fun Q&A. Big old session. We answered all the que all the questions. All the questions. Put the world to rights, we did. And we also had another brilliant guest episode from Mr. Tim Cloak. Very popular. Always popular. Always Mr. very good. Always, always very good. It's a bastard. <laughs> always comes up with interesting stories we haven't found. Yes, yeah, so he writes them so well. And yeah. they've always got little bits of tidbits in Where them. Where does he find his... His things. History. 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 <laughs> being, in the history. <laughs> him being a history teacher helps him needing to Fine. know the facts. He knows his history. Yes. And then this week we, we had the we had the gold robbery. The, the gold, great, the, the great, great gold, gold robbery. robbery. <laughs> great gold train robbery. We, no. But we got to the bottom of that. We did. And we it was did. great. It was good fun. It was good fun. It was in yeah, Folkestone. And yeah, surprising. Yes. If you want to know what the hell we're talking about, please do consider joining us on Patreon. Patreon is a platform that supports us as creators and you get an extra episode every single week as well as lots of bonus content and fun and frolics and, and it's a lovely community as well. We love our Patreon subscribers. We get to chat to you every now and then with our little book club too. So if you want to know more, please go to patreon.com forward slash the poisonous cabinet or drop us a message if you would like more information. Well, Nick, are you 
ready. Oh, uh, it's been two weeks <laughs> without the story. <laughs> You've been poised. I've been poised for two weeks, just waiting. Keeping yourself in a state of cat-like Absolutely. readiness. <laughs> always, always ready. Ready to bounce. For a snooze. To drink cocktails and talk about poison. Mm. Or, or, or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Yes to all Let's of do that. that. Okay, I'll make the decision for You'll us, shall for I? <laughs> I've, I've, done, I've done it 171 times. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time you shoulder the burden here, Sinead. <laughs> okay, you have a lie down. And I think it's been two weeks, we need a cocktail. <laughs> Definitely. Because it's not as if we haven't had two cocktails before starting this. No, 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 no. Let's go with the first one. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story this week, and we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell, and it for flavor, our cocktail of the week. My story is so my pick, mm. and this week's secret ingredient is mm. grog. 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 Okay. Ah, for muddy pirates. Now, is grog a thing? Yeah. It is a thing. It's a thing. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. So my understanding of grog is that it is the piratey kind of grog. I'm not basing this entirely on Monkey Island, but I'm basing this entirely <laughs> on Monkey Island. I mean, there are worse historical resources out there. Yep, <laughs> Guybrush Streetwood, you know, who needs to rule us all. But also, the, the grog was also what you were given in slum houses and stuff like that. It's just like a mix of old shit, basically. Grog is just sort of an in nondescript alcohol as I understood it mm. but I've never really looked into it okay. and then I couldn't because I didn't want to <laughs> spoil whatever this cocktail was but but it's an actual thing it's a thing ah mm. are you going to make it for us we're having some grog <gasps> is that it yeah <laughs> right. is, is th- that's the cocktail we're, we're having some grog oh we're just having grog yeah okay you, you, you asked for it <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't that feels say. like a slightly threatening wasn't it <laughs> yeah it's a threat and a fact you didn't want to give it a new name no, no, it's just grog. Gordon's grog? Bog stands at old grog. Okay, fine. Fair enough. All right, well, that was a build-up that I didn't need to do. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm ready for some grog. I'm and glad. To find out the mysteries of it. I think it is high time for us to sail into the Poisoner's Cabinet Kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Well, Nick. We've got our grog. Grogity, grogity, grog. Yay. Yay. All right. Well, well, I'm hopeful that grog is a nice thing and not what I thought it was. That's um, question one. Yeah, we'll find out. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Well, it's it's a night. It's a long drink. It's got ice. It has Over some ice. Over ice as well. We don't often yeah. have something on the rocks. It's brown. Brown. Brown usually serves us well. We we dive in. Yeah. Let's we'll okay. see what happens. It smells of... It's, oh, what does it smell of? Oh, a- aromatic. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Should not have given you two Negronis before this. But anyway, let's anyway, see what happens. See what happens. All right. Okay, David. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, hello. Hello, sailor. Ooh. Hello. Ooh, that, <laughs> is, uh, that is citrusy. That is sharp. Mm. Mm-hmm. I like it. It's good. I think. My face has been attacked. <laughs> by mm. pirates. <laughs> pirates. I feel like I'm setting this up for something that's not going to happen <laughs> in this episode. So, yeah. Oh, all right. Very sharp. Yeah. But now I'm immediately going back for a second Absolutely. drink because it kind of went yeah. to nothing. I'm not sure. Oh, I could. I'll have that. Oh, okay. No, that's good. Oh, that's dangerous. Yeah. That's really sharp. So there's a lot of citrus in there. It's got something behind it. Something <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> it doesn't have a long aftertaste. No. I'll say that. So I'm going to say it's not spirit forward, but I might be wrong. I, I would agree with that, yeah. your assertion there. Nice drink, though. Yeah. yeah. And good aut- autumnal. Yes. It feels autumnal. That is, yeah, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. I'm going to stick with that. I don't okay. know. What's <laughs> Could be all the tastes of summer in this, and I don't know. But then I'm an idiot, so. Mm. Okay, so lime. There is some lime. Yes, and why do I know that? Because I said, Sinead, do you have any limes? <laughs> okay, lime. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess. Okay, so grog, is it rum-based? It is rum. It is rum-based, because pirates and navy so- okay i've got to say it right now there's no pirates in this story well i think that's very disappointing <laughs> you see you 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 give grogs an ingredient and you think oh there's gonna be some high seas shenanigans going on <laughs> i wish i feel bad now maybe so, we should yeah. have gone with some of the other ingredients okay but you went with grog and I'm, oh, okay um but the other but- one was a razor <laughs> for, for reasons that will become clear but, Grog or a razor I'm going to go with Grog Well I'm glad you've gone with Grog Expecting piratey goodness <laughs> I'm sorry 
Anyway, this drink, <laughs> I've got rum and lime, and that's obliterating my fucking brain cells, apparently. There's other things in it? Um, not really? No. Oh, really? Not not that much? No. Uh, I don't know, bitters? Oh, it's bitters? Oh, it's bitters. Oh, that's yeah. the aroma. Anything else? Bit of sugar. Oh, is that it? That's it. So it's rum, lime, and sugar. That's grog. That's grog. That's grog. Yeah. I had no idea. Aye. I thought grog was was some sort of wintry mold drink or something. That's what a lot of people seem to be. Well, out there, there. there there is there is a story that I've I'm very much hooked into, which some people believe think is apocryphal, and okay. some people think is no. This is this is where grog comes from. Tell so, us everything. So back in the day, we're talking sort of 18th century, 1700s, sort of British Navy fighting all over the place boats going here there and everywhere <laughs> <laughs> as boats tend to do as they do yeah singing that <laughs> sailors song. enjoy a bit of rum they do and as a, a rule as a broad on ship sailors were entitled to half a pint of neat rum per day nice um and then you might get a bit more if you're going into battle you might get a bit more mm. for a bit of dutch, yeah, dutch, you get a, courage. dutch courage um, which which is where Gen- Geneva <laughs> comes, comes from. from it was very confusing on the boats dutch <laughs> courage we're having gin no wait we're, it's rum it's rum but it's we're having some jamaican courage um, <laughs> so, um but yeah so so rum was a big thing on board ships to maintain morale and keep everyone jolly mm. however in around sort of mid 1700s so like 1750 1760 one particular admiral was getting rather annoyed about all the sailors just being pissed <laughs> on half a pint of neat rum and shouting bumbo. <laughs> just like you just get that doled out once a day, like half a pint of rum. Yeah, neck and knocking which it back. Which is a lot. Yeah, which is a lot of rum. It's a lot of rum. <laughs> this admiral said, "Right, okay, no. <laughs> what we're going to do is you get your rum in two rations, so you get a quarter of a pint each. <laughs> quarter, quarter of a pint, two times a day. Right. But it is split with one part rum, four parts water." So you get okay. a quarter of a pint of rum and is made up to a pint with water. Still seems dangerous, but fine. Still, yeah, so you got a quarter. So they, they got that. And then they would add limes to combat scurvy. scurvy. You have citrus, the, the vitamins in limes and lemons to combat scurvy. Mm. This admiral was nicknamed Old Grogram. Oh! Because he was renowned for wearing this tatty old Grogram. is a type of fabric. It's a very like, rough spun is woolen it? fabric that was used. Um, and he was renowned for wearing this ratty old cloak um, when he was aboard ship. It's like a waterproof <laughs> sort of thing. And he was nicknamed Old Grogram, was this admiral. So the drink that he sort of <laughs> Inst- instructed that all his his sailors had to have became grog. Amazing. After this, after this admiral. Oh, that's amazing! I, I yeah. no idea of that story. That's <laughs> so fantastic. That's, that's, that's where the story. I can't imagine it was shaken over ice. No. <laughs> <laughs> A, a Someone was standing there shaking it up. No, you're taking a bit of liberties here, sir. But, um, yeah, but a quarter pint of rum, three quarters of water, a load of lime juice, combat the scurvy, get that down you, go and blow those Frenchmen up. Well, there you go. It's a cock- <laughs> It's one of the first cocktails. So there we go. There are some people who think it, this is entirely apocryphal and is, is nonsense, mm. but I like it. That's so a I'm great story. I think it. it's a great story. I love that. <laughs> and I love this drink. Grog is delicious. Yeah. Grog is delicious. So um, it's none of that in the story, so by the way. We're not doing any of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the more I was writing this. And I have to say, Grog is very important to this story for reasons that will become clear. But I was like, oh, Nick's going to kill me because there's no pirates <laughs> in this. So I'm sorry if I've set everyone up for this. But that is delicious and that's going to go down very easy isn't it oh, gotcha. yeah. in my episode so um yeah you crack uh, on there you you crack on you finish the various negronis that are on the table <laughs> well with a grog firmly in hand absolutely we've sailed into port shall we go into battle <laughs> let's get off the boat there's no there's no sailing of the high seas there there's enough <laughs> that life you've left behind uh would you like a story Nick? oh yes okay nick yes two households both alike in dignity <laughs> In fair Sydney, where we lay our scene. Okay. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. (laughs) Right. No, we're not telling the story of Romeo and Juliet. (laughs) You've got Romeo and Juliet. That opening of Romeo and Juliet kept coming back to me when I was uh, writing this story. And it's not the crime of Romeo being a little bitch. (laughs) Because he is in that play, let's face it. No, we are telling the story of not one, but two. Pirates. 
criminal masterminds. Uh, oh, oh, that's almost as good as a pirate. When I say masterminds, crime bosses. Oh, okay. Commanders, if you will, but pirates no, of the land. Of the land, <laughs> pirates of the land. They were known as. Let's go with that. It's as close as we're going to get. <laughs> Who wage bloody war on the streets of Sydney? Nice. Okay. In the early 1900s, uh, a story of blades, booze, dames, drugs, diamonds, and some seriously sly grog. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm intrigued to see where this goes. Now, sly grog. Is a phrase that certain people are going. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not a phrase I'm not familiar with. No, the grog isn't just like sneaky. I'm not just like. I was going to say it's very sneaky grog. <laughs> it's wearing a false moustache. Now we are off to the beautiful shores of Australia this week to Sydney, the wonderful city Sydney, and I'm going to say hello to our many fans down under. Hello. We do have some fans, and I'm going to shout out to our patreons: Nicola, Leah, Megan, Chloe, Jess, Mel, Melissa, and if anyone else has joined us from Australia this week and I didn't note them down, I'm very sorry, but yep, did throw stuff at me. But hello, darlings, hello. <laughs> And our central players, two crime bosses, are both women. Nice. Like it. We are going to tell the story of the many crimes and the infamous rivalry between Kate Lee and Tilly Devine. Ooh. <laughs> I'm really excited. But first of all, we're going to do a bit of scene setting nice. to explain why we're here and why, why we we're here? drinking why grog. Why on earth are we here? So... Before we talk about these ladies, Sydney in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, crime is rife. Rife. Beautiful, beautiful city it is now. I've been there. It's lovely. I went there a while ago. It was very nice when I went there. <laughs> Most of the popular and expensive areas in Sydney today were complete slums way back then. Wow, it's the same as anywhere, isn't it? Same as anywhere. Same yeah. as London. Same as New York. Anything like that. No one with money at the time in the early part of the 20th century lived in the city. They all moved out to the suburbs. The likes of Surrey Hills, Wallamaloo, Darlinghurst. The poor working class people from the factories that were based there, they lived in that area and these are slums and they are rife with gangs, drugs, sex work, drink. But between 1900 and the late 1920s, several changes occurred in the law in Sydney that opened it up massively to criminals. Okay. And this very famous rivalry between Tilly Devine and Kate Lee, the two crime bosses, allowed them to rise to power and this rivalry emerged. But it was because of the various laws that were passed that crime became rife. Okay. And as ever, any bad laws start with people trying to stop you drinking. <laughs> Very true. Never ends well. If you try and stop people doing bad things, bad things are going to happen. Did they do prohibition in Australia? So, good question. So, not prohibition directly there was a big campaign for it so the temperance movement from the late 1800s and into the 1900s were very keen obviously like drink is the devil let's 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 find a way of getting rid of drink they wanted to prohibit drink and around the time of the first world war the temperance movements made a lot of call outs to limit drink as much as possible to help society yes. so they didn't get to prohibition what they did is restricted alcohol sales by time Oh, okay. So in 1916, a law was passed in Sydney after a tiny bit of campaigning, and then it was passed to shut hotels and bars, or hot hotels mainly because that's where the bars were, at 6 p.m. Oh. Cut off. Right. Cut off. You couldn't go out and buy a drink outside at 6 p.m., and you couldn't really buy alcohol anywhere no. else after that. Australia was involved in the First World War. There is a need for austerity but also a feeling that there needs to be decorum at home. Um, yeah. Yeah. The temperance movement argued a well-ordered, self-disciplined and morally upright home front was a precondition for the successful prosecution of the war. Okay. Yeah. There was no way that we could win, no matter what you were actually doing on the Western Front, <laughs> unless everyone was behaving themselves the back home. home was sober. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've won. Before they gave you the medal of winning. <laughs> the medal of winning. <laughs> that happens in wars. <laughs> exactly. That's how wars are won, aren't they? Absolutely. The medal of winning. It just goes around. <laughs> they were just about to hand it over going, wait a minute. We've heard some Australians are drunk. None for you. 
<laughs> this may sound weird, but well, no, the metal bit is definitely weird. <laughs> so, yeah, it does. Yeah. You can imagine the situation. The situation same in in many countries around the world. During and after World War One, you have men and families who are completely devastated by war. You have um, in Australia, you have many men who have been trained up as soldiers. They've been going to camps and training with not very good conditions. Then they're sent abroad there's a lot of ill feeling about that going are we cannon fodder and then they come back they are shell-shocked they are devastated by the effects of war and also they have no money they have no means to support their family their families have been suffering so what happens then everyone's drinking everyone is drinking in a very roundabout way but it's true and men are also carrying guns a lot Mm. as well going oh we gave you guns can we have them back no 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 no, no, no. (laughs) real stress and maybe the liquor act maybe the temperance movement might not have been as successful going you know what if we ban drinking this will actually stop everyone from being depressed it was actually the liverpool riot of 1916 in australia australian soldiers who had been training who had been sent to the training camps uh, a camp called cassula i think it's pronounced which was a camp outside of sydney thousands of men were stationed at this camp the conditions were horrible they were being forced to work and train like 27 hours on the trot there was one report absolutely horrific conditions and they were stressed and completely out of it and thousands of soldiers rioted and they went into sydney and it's well documented they rioted they looted they were smashing stuff up they were beating people up it was horrifying and they were all like we want to drink and they were going into hotel bars and actually smashing things up resulted in the police killing one man one soldier and then everyone, oh shit, this shit has gone down. Mm. So, But it helped to fuel the temperance movement going, if these soldiers hadn't been so desperate for a drink and trying to try and go out to the bars, none of this rioting none would this have happened. None of this would have ever happened. You know, you don't look back and kind of go, maybe maybe the conditions were not so great. Maybe everyone's a little yeah. bit stressed. So 6 p.m. closing was floated as a temporary measure, but then it was very much made permanent in 1919 and in, again in 1923 when no one consulted at that time. Beforehand, just, just people... Just bring it on, yeah. Just let it slide over. Yeah, beforehand people were kind of okay with it and then they were like oh no we don't like this and they're well, just fair like, enough in, in a time of war you do give up uh, one would imagine you would give up shit mm. you would go okay fine the greater good the greater the greater that. good but come 1923 there's no wars here <laughs> everyone's like, everyone else is having a jolly old time yeah i want to drink yes i know we may be poor and the depression is is around the corner yeah. when you have a 6 p.m cut off everyone's thinking ah that's the key everyone will just go home and read their bible nah yeah, no one who has finished work is going to be absolutely gagging for a drink. No, what you have then with the 6 p.m. cutoff is what was called the six o'clock swill. Yeah, you must have had a mad rush of people trying to get a drink, like last orders of, on a bloody New Year's <laughs> Eve or something. <laughs> Literally <laughs> that, yeah. So this is just a sort of a side story, but still, it's people battling to get into bars to get as much drink as possible and to get as full as possible. Mm. Anyone who is in there early, saving up all their glasses. Line them up, absolutely. Line them up. All right, fill them up. Last orders, guys. Yeah, here's 10 glasses. <laughs> There's all sorts of stories which are a, a passed into folklore, but with the landlords of the bar fixing hoses to the pipes just so they could sort of spray drink at people <laughs> so they wouldn't have to move around adding more tiles into their bars to make it easier to clean up because of the raging <laughs> drinking that was going on and everyone's getting pissed and then everyone's going out on the street and getting yeah. you know getting hammered no one is going home for some prayer and cabbage no. no people are fighting to get drunk fighting to get drink the demand for liquor is not very high so this is where the sly grog trade comes in Mm -hmm. sly grog is an expression still used today in parts of australia and around the world actually but mainly in australia sly grog being a legal drink like it there you go there you go so no pirates i'm sure some pirates were there got confused (laughs) and then left later on there would also be more laws passed they they kept trying god bless them they kept trying uh prohibiting the sale of cocaine in chemists well, where's the fun in that? I know. There are I limits, know. I hear. <laughs> come on, there are limits. Fine, ban the drink. But the, but the coke, come the on. Coke. How else am I supposed to go dancing? <laughs> yeah, the coke, obviously, at this time, used for everything. Uh, yeah. Dentists using it all the time. Toothache, cocaine, rub okay. some cocaine in Absolutely. it. You've got ghosts in your blood, have some cocaine. Toothache, headache, anything like that. And then after a while, the, co- the authorities go, Woo, people seem to be going mad. And <laughs> they're very stressed and paranoid. They're getting a lot of work done. Yeah, but, but they're um, very chatty. <laughs> yes, they're very chatty. So in... In 1927, the Dangerous Drugs Act was launched. So this is a a few years later, but this cracks down the sale of cocaine by chemists. So you can't just go into your local chemist and buy some coke. Oh, it was a fun time. It was a fun time. (laughs) No more selling drugs casually. 
People are pissed off about that. There was also laws that prohibited um, street prostitution. So you can't have any fun there God. either. And laws banning men from running brothels. Just just men? Mm-hmm. Okay. You have this massive demand for illegal booze and all the fun things associated <laughs> with it. <laughs> all the fun things in life. The perfect breeding ground for ruthless gangsters. And two people would emerge to reign supreme over Sydney. So let's start with Kate Lee. Mm. Now, Kate Lee was born Kathleen Behan. In 1881, in Dubbo, in New South Wales. Um, eighth child of 13. Christ. Yes, yes. C- Catholic family, unsurprisingly. Surprised there. Yeah. yeah, poor, poor though. Now, it was said that from a young age, Kate was headstrong, wild, loved to run away from home. She was the troubled child, her and a couple of other, other siblings. Oh, she didn't want to listen to her parents. She didn't want to go to school. She wouldn't do anything. She probably wasn't going to get much of an education. Um, it ends up with her being taken into an industrial school for girls Parramatta, I believe it's pronounced, industrial school for girls because the parents just went, oh, we can't handle her anymore. It goes as a, a as a case of neglect, mm. just because they either go, we really cannot we be bothered can't, with can't her, deal with she's wild, children. take her away. <laughs> this school for girls, not very nice, hard labour. Yeah, an industrial school for girls does not sound like a fun place to be. No, it's not like yes, it's not like a delightful finishing school. Of here, you will learn embroidery and how to. <laughs> <laughs> On which fork to use. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's so bitches. (laughs) So and scrub and clean. You are going to be destined for a life in the factories. You are going to be working as a domestic servant or doing menial manual labor. And this is all you're good for. That is what you will learn here. You will get no other education. You'll get no love. You'll get no support. And she stays in this home um, until she's about 20 years old. During this time, she does have a child. Uh, out of wedlock. Kate always vehemently denied that she ever engaged in sex work herself. So she had a child. The child actually sort of stayed in her life. She had a kind of a fractured relationship with them, but still. But when she leaves, she is not broken. She is not thinking, I'm going to have a life of servitude. She's like, I am going to defy everyone. I ain't doing that for us. Completely (laughs) determined she is going to be her own woman and no one is going to tell her what to do. So she goes to Sydney around 1901. She spends the next few years in and out of jail. Trouble with the law, vagrancy, begging, whatever, petty crime. She's mm. well into, immediately into the petty crimes. It gets two weeks in prison for vagrancy at one point, And she would just have this pattern of many spells in jail. So she meets a bookie, a legal bookie, obviously. Oh, obviously. No, a, an illegal bookie. Made it sound like I said he was a legal bookie. A bookie, fuck it. A bookie, let's just go with a bookie. <laughs> yeah, criminal, <laughs> criminal. Named Jack Lee. They get married and that's where she gets the name kate lee his name is actually l-e-e because he's half chinese okay. but she anglicizes it and oh. turns it into l-e-i-g-h Ooh, I see. Mm, decides to do that they spend some time together he's arrested for assault and robbery on their landlord kate provides an alibi for him um he still gets sent to jail she yeah. narrowly escapes a perjury charge but she does this a lot she provides alibis for people for anyone. <laughs> Just oh, like... yeah, yeah, yeah yeah they were like oh no i was never there and the land apparently the landlord said no you pushed me off a ladder <laughs> many people saw <laughs> many people saw it was hilarious but still <laughs> painful so but then she hooks up with various other criminals um in her life didn't rely on men to provide her with a living she was going to go out and she was going to fence stolen goods she was going to sort of build up her little criminal world she came a cropper in 1914 when she got involved with some of the city's most notorious criminals and tried to provide an alibi for them in court when they were accused of committing the Everly railway workshop robbery this is a very very famous robbery that was oh i feel another railway robbery <laughs> It is, yes. No, it was the workshop. The workshop they robbed. They weren't on the railway. But Ooh. it's famous because it was in broad daylight and it was the first use of a de- getaway car in Australian crime history. Nice. There you go. Well, that's a future episode. There you are. Uh, it was reported, Sydney Morning Herald said, for audacity of conception and cool effrontery of execution, it could hardly have been surpassed. Oh, nice. But one of the perpetrators, Samuel Freeman, had been Kate's boyfriend, and she tried to provide him with an alibi in court, going, no, he was with me all night. And they went, no, he wasn't. He very clearly wasn't. He wasn't. He was sent to jail. She got five years for perjury. Ooh. Yeah, ah. so she sent off to jail. Like, mm. Her time in jail... Never bothered Kate. Nah. Did not care whatsoever. Did not nothing to deter her. Also, she spent all her childhood growing up in a very unpleasant institution. Well. I can't imagine she's... Yeah, it's not like she's lived a, a comfortable life until now. And exactly. Prison is probably, yeah. Oh, I get a meal. I get three meals a day. Three meals yeah. a day. <laughs> right then. <laughs> and she can mix with other criminals. She yeah. can make contact. Make connections. 
It's a great old networking situation. Exactly. Kate is a shrewd businesswoman yeah. as a criminal, really. She knows that she can make contacts with people. She can sort herself out on the outside, build a really good empire for herself. And mm. she can. she's always thinking about her next move. So while she's in jail is the time that society is changing. It's during this time this law is passed that says, no, no, 6 p.m., that's when everything closes <laughs> and no one can have any booze. She's understanding that, oh, my God, there's a real demand for Sly Grog. And if you can get hold of Sly Grog and open basically a speakeasy, yeah. your quid's in. So she decides this is her ticket. When she's released, she works to set up these Sly Grog shops. Sly Groggeries, they were called. Delightful. Mm -hmm. Talks to people, builds up friends, builds up context, starts paying people off, starts making friends in the police. She's very charming, Kate. She is ruthless, but she's kind to the right people. You know, she's a very good networker. That's mm. the thing that people say about Kate. And she gets wholesale supplies of drinks. She works out a deal where she can get wholesale supply as if she's setting up her own business, which is basically okay. her house. Her <laughs> house. And then she sells it. And the system is that people come to her house, knock on the door and ask for mum. They're coming to see mum. Brilliant. Come to see her. Yeah. Oh, it's a very... I'm, I'm getting vibes of Ronnie and Reggie Cray going on there. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, yeah. But yeah, come and see mum. And she's like, oh yeah, mum. And everyone's like, oh, I'm off to see mum. It basically meant I'm going to go get a drink. Now, she always portrayed herself as not being a criminal. She says, I'm providing for the community. At a premium, obviously, and massively marked up prices. But these are people, poor people who have suffered, who are working hard in the factories in horrible conditions. People who have come back from the war, people who have nothing... And then not being allowed to drink in the evening. She's like, fine, I'll provide it. Yep, I'll make a profit off it. Yeah. But why not? Why should they be punished? Why the hell not? So plenty of people are on her side. Yeah. They like her. Now, if you're going to run this kind of racket, you're going to need a gang. You're going to need to set Definitely. up your own protection rackets and you are going to need to, yeah, employ a bit of muscle. She not only operated these sly groggeries, hmm. she also commanded her own razor gangs. Oh, that sounds unpleasant. Now, this is the time of the Razor Gangs in Sydney. Yeah. And it's a whole thing. <laughs> the reason they're called Razor Gangs is that, okay, take it as read that obviously in Sydney at this sort of time, you have gangs. You yeah. have criminal underworld, you have gangs operating territories and they're going to be running booze, drugs, vice, whatever it is. They're called Razor Gangs because of the Pistol Licensing Act, which cracked down on anyone carrying handguns. Yep. Now, this, again, is an offshoot from the war, from soldiers. Oh, okay, you're getting drunk out there. You can't carry a handgun out in public. So you couldn't carry guns. Yeah, have a knife. They switch to... And these are the cutthroat yeah. razors. And it becomes this absolute symbol of terror. You have these gangs going around very proudly holding these razors mm. and they have them on their person women men everyone has these razors you can cut people you can scar them you can tag people they are, they are scary things they are scary and they are going to cut deep yeah, as well absolutely. yeah they are they are not to be trifled with so no, she indeed. has her own gang she is amassed her own crew to control her territories and she has um sly grog shops she has about up to 25 at any time she is controlling the supply of booze around there. As she goes through the 20s, she is risen up as one of the, mm. if not the, criminal boss in Sydney running this. And this is no exaggeration at all. People are going to have grog, like um, branch into drugs. Drugs. You know what people like with their booze? Drugs. Yeah. And then maybe a bit of sex Absolutely. as well. Yeah, a few brothels, a few brothels. She worked with chemists and doctors, any manner of professionals, to start the uh, snow trade as it was called, mm. Snow, in Surrey Hill Streets. That was it. She defended her territories with br all the brutality that you would expect of a kingpin. Again, being very well liked in herself, but she sort of sent her minions mm. out. Competition was fierce. She could wield a rifle as well as she could a razor. <laughs> she wasn't afraid to mess with anyone who got yeah. in her way. And she offered bribes and alibis to other gangsters for protection. And she was a very well-known friend of the police. She paid, she paid very, well. very yeah. well. She paid very well. She was smart in that sense. She would be dubbed the Queen of the Underworld. Nice. The Queen of Surrey Hills and the worst woman in Sydney. <laughs> in Brilliant. the press. Never drank or smoked herself. Well, you wouldn't really. You see what it does to everyone. Yeah, you're taking advantage of these people who are getting pissed and, yeah, smoking whatever and all this. You would think, I'm not, not, not having anything to do with that. Well, she thought that was a wise choice yeah. she was quite the character 
as well as herself. She was differently described as um, corpulent, flousy, leather skinned, had rings on every finger though, dressed in the finest clothes, big hats. Nice. Big line and big hats. Big hats. Had a rough voice and swore. Excellent. Yeah. Um, she was short and thick. One of the things she loved to do was attend court cases as a spectator and just peel vegetables while she was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the vegetables were for her dinner, and she'd yeah, be well, shucking absolutely. peas and peeling carrots and stuff, and and then would just heckle the judge. And nice, <laughs> yeah, because she was Kate Lee. Exactly. Like, <laughs> Who the hell's going to tell her not to? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. She has a mass and empire. She is rising to the top, but someone's casting a shadow yeah. over that empire, and that woman is Tilly Divine. Oh, Tilly. I think we might need a drink. Oh God, go on then. So Tilly Devine, Tilly Devine, the other woman who is forever, these two women's names are forever linked. Tilly was born Matilda Twiss in England. Oh, okay. Mm. So in 1900, so she's younger mm. than Kate. She's the daughter oh, of a bricklayer. Young upstart who's oh. coming in. She needs to be taught a lesson. Daughter of a bricklayer. Her Englishness would always haunt her, apparently. Yeah, I can imagine it not been going down too well. Not so much after the war as well. And and people don't make a huge thing about that there was particular xenophobia or anything about it. But she, she's always going to be a foreigner. And she felt that keenly. I can think at the time it was still the whole sort of ex-empire type thing. Mm. And so it's still like, oh, we got sent over there to fight someone else's war because they were part of the empire and all that sort yeah. of bollocks. The, there may have been a bit of that, but mainly we'll, we'll come on to the rivalry there. I don't think the Englishness bothered her possibly more than it bothered other people, okay. but she she made sure that if anyone was bothered with her, they they, they shut the fuck up about <laughs> it. But in her they weren't bothered for long. No. <laughs> as a child, she'd worked in match factories. She had worked in, she'd laboured away, she'd worked as a domestic as a very, very young age. But as soon as she sort of, well, let's not say came of age, mm. She apparently decided to go into sex work herself. Okay. She would always say she controlled the narrative it was on her that. Choice. She said yeah. it was her choice, whether that was or not, but she was never shied away from it. Never shied away from okay. it. When she was working in the factories and whatever she was doing, she also would walk to the apparently to the affluent parts of London and look at people in the fancy restaurants and the music halls and dream of that life mm. and go, I want that life. Don't we all? <laughs> yes. So and she decided to go into sex work to to give herself a better income and she worked down the strand. Okay. On the strand, down the strand. she was. And it was there that she met a serviceman who was Australian, Jim Devine. That would be her future husband. He was from Australia. He was in England. Met her probably through her work. Let's 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 face it. Yep. But he fell for her. Promised her a life of riches and happiness and kangaroos back and kangaroos. In, um, in Australia. And I'm not just saying that because Australia. He said he was a kangaroo farmer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And sheep. And sheep. He threw in some sheep. kangaroo and sheep. They got married, and she would go back to Australia as a war bride. They did have a son. Son stayed with the grandparents. Oh, okay. Did not go with Tilly. Mm. Yeah, they're just like, okay, you look after you stay here. But they arrived in Australia. Tilly continued her trade on the streets immediately. Jim was a shit. Yeah, yeah. not a nice man. Didn't have any kangaroos or sheep or money. No, it was all lies. lies. He was known as a petty crook, uh, a pimp, uh, just a rubbish, horrible, horrible man. Happy using his fists. Yeah against anyone who got in his way he would be accused of murder several times he would shoot wow. rival petty criminals beat tilly yeah. definitely beat beat tilly tilly was fearsome herself she stayed in this relationship with him for ages maybe because of his connections or whatever happened but mm. definitely was in this abusive marriage he lived off her for the extent of their marriage Tilly would remarry several times, but yeah, he was her ticket to Australia. Mm. He would actually be charged with trying to murder Tilly oh, in 1931. Delightful. But a lovely, uh, lovely man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't testify against him. That's why he got off. But eventually they would separate. But she was there to make her fortune. She worked as a prostitute herself, set up her own brothels around the Wollamaloo area of Sydney. She was very good looking when she was younger, when she first arrived in Australia, and very popular, very, oh, very, very popular as a sex worker. In the first five years she was in Australia, she got in trouble with the law 70 times, plus. Okay. For using indecent language. <laughs> like it. Offensive behaviour. 
and assaulting people randomly. Grand. She she would assault Johns if they if they didn't pay her. Oh, quite right. She'd absolutely mess them up. <laughs> and she threw fabulous parties as well. She loved to drink and smoke. Brilliant. Whereas Kate didn't. Oh no, yeah, she, was she was drinking and doing that. And so by the her late twenties, she was losing her looks. People said said to yeah it, it, the drinking and smoking and taking, good taking life toll. <laughs> had taken their toll. But then she decides to run her own brothels. So Tilly is a brothel queen, really, mm. here. she That's her trade. She's going to use the loophole. Men aren't allowed to Men run brothels. Men aren't allowed, yeah. I'm allowed to. Says nothing about women, and she can. Yeah. She opens up, again, between 25 and 30 brothels throughout her career. Okay. And she will set them up, and she will run them with an iron fist, you know, with love with one hand and an iron yeah. fist in the other. So she had different classes of girls for different clients. For the businessmen and politicians, they had the cool girls. For the casual clients, tenement girls. These are the women who needed some extra work while mm-hmm. they were fruit picking and things like that. And the sailors got boat girls. <laughs> okay. Yes, you need a strong woman to handle all that. Season. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Tilly would open these brothels. She took 50% of the earnings okay. she provided the girls with health care she provided them with protection she provided mm-hmm. them with accommodation with clothes with anything like that she was very very kind to them as long as they were loyal doesn't sound entirely unreasonable as a business proposition they tried to move to another brothel they tried to quit she was not happy yeah. and they would be punished mm-hmm. and we're talking being scarred no, and stuff that's, like that's that less fun. as much as tilly controlled the narrative about her own life and she was very vocal about the women in the sex trade many people wanted to go into the sex trade to to, to have extra money she was definitely involved in trafficking yeah yeah um, i yeah. think we can say that yeah this this was not a nice situation oh, these girls did not have a lot of choice but those who stayed willingly were treated were very treated, very treated well very well but yes she has this empire of brothels loves the attention as well like Kate. oh my god she wants to be walking around she is wearing the finest of clothes she was wearing the latest fashions she had diamond rings on every hand nice. and every finger of every <laughs> hand was weighed down by them known to be very pretentious very pretentious. Brilliant. She believed she was a class above everyone else. Mm-hmm. Is that the Englishness of her coming mm. through? But she was also ruthless and violent. And she wanted to... Quite English as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to have this reputation. She wanted to look stylish, but she was not going to be a little wallflower. In 1925, she was sent to jail for assault after walking into a barber shop. A gentleman was having a shave. Whether she knew him or not is debatable. She went, that's the man, went up to him, took out her razor, the cutthroat Mm. razor, slashed his hand so badly it spurted blood in his face. Okay. And he was like, what the fuck is going on? What have I done? Yeah. Just walked in, slashed up this guy. When she went to court, she was in her best outfit, fur, silver fox furs and everything. And Kate used to wear the same sort of thing, looking absolutely fantastic because Mm. she knew she'd built a fearsome reputation. And when she got out and she would pay her way through jail times to to lessen her sentences, her reputation had spread all over the city. She had the best brothels, the best girls, and she was a force to be reckoned with. One paper reported her going into a butcher's shop. This is how feared she was, that she'd bought some beef and she came back in and said that it wasn't good beef. And she took out a butcher's knife and went round to all the clientele in the shop asking them to smell the beef. And to tell her that it is, was, is it good meat? And none of them were, were going to go, no, it's good meat, it's fine. They were like, oh, it's awful, it's awful. Yes. So there she is, wielding a knife and saying, smell my beef. Okay. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> at the peak of these two women's careers, you could be drinking in one of Kate Lee's sly grog shops and then be stumbling into one of Tilly Devine's popular brothels. There's a slight overlap of business going on there, though, isn't there? So, yes. Yeah, you can imagine if one stocks the grog shops and one stocks the brothels, then probably all would have lived in harmony. And they predominantly did. It's kind of depending on which books you read. There's some yeah. uh, you know, outstanding books about these two women. And some writers have it that they both stayed in their own lanes, but they just started a rivalry between each other because there were two women and women are catty. Um, <laughs> you know, it's what women it, do. It, it is what women do. <laughs> it, it's more than likely they both encroached on yeah. each other's business. You know, If you're going to have a brothel, you're going to need booze, you're going to need drugs, same Absolutely. sort of thing. You, you're going to want to call it. You're going to make there's, as much there's money there's as possible. There's going to be overlap there and that's going to cause fisticuffs. There was definitely overlap and these are two women who have clawed their way to the top and and taken out other gangsters mm. there were various cases of male gangsters coming some coming up from melbourne who were like we're going to make our way in sydney there's two women running things yeah <laughs> we'll put them down gun down in the street by their Not henchmen like absolutely taken out but 
if they're clawing to the top, you've got two women. One's number one, one's number two, but both of them want to be number one. <laughs> so this is where the rivalry between them begins. And very good writers have covered the fact that these women would never have succeeded, never become who they were, if the state hadn't tried to curb all the things that they were doing. Oh, quite absolutely. Yeah. Now, how their rivalry started could have been just down to the cocaine. The cocaine is the most vicious uh, market, it was said, obviously. Trying to hone in on drugs and obviously and getting all the contacts with the chemists and everything. And that was the most bitter battle that was fought on the streets. But really, maybe it was all about dogs. Okay, you throw a curve- curveball there slightly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, apparently Pomeranians. Pomeranians were their real beef. Okay. Yep. They had <laughs> prolonged battles reported in the press. They would talk to the press about how much they hated each other based on their mutual love of dogs. Right. Yeah. Wasn't expecting that one. No, no, no one is. No one does expect the Pomeranians. Wasn't expecting the Pomeranians. (laughs) So you've thrown me. (laughs) How it started is it's it's one or the other started. Tilly got wind of Kate having Pomeranians, and these are pedigrees, obviously. Yeah. So then apparently Tilly got some. Kate then claimed Tilly had stolen one of her dogs. Oh. So who had the dogs first, don't know, but then they both started saying, how dare she have Pomeranians, she's copying me. She's copying me. Or she's stolen my dog, she's stolen them. Tilly would write to the press, and this is taken from one of the the great books about the, the ladies as well, after responding to claims from Kate Lee that Tilly had stolen one of her dogs. Tilly wrote, Kate lies. These are my dogs. I have their pedigree and they are a class above hers. I do not wish to know her class. Kate is jealous of my youth and prosperity. I know too much for her and that's why she hates me. I think myself a class above her. The underworld take their hats off to me and class me as a lady. Kate is the biggest police informant in Sydney. Oh, mm. that's not going to make you many friends, is it? No, <laughs> but they just, they, they would send letters and they would talk to the press all the time, bitching about each other. <laughs> the thing is with, between the two of them, it was said that Kate was more loved by the community because Tilly had this haughtiness about her. Yeah, she seems, I can, I can imagine Kate being a bit more get in there with the people type thing. That's what I'm, I'm getting that sort of vibe exactly that she'll that. be in there. Whereas Tilly, yeah, is more haughty and more, yeah. I was in my minions to deal with this. Is that violent? Type of thing. Very, very yeah. violent and very, uh, very cool. I can imagine the people being yeah. behind Kate. Yeah, Kate, Kate is not exactly a lady. You know, she no. she was she would swear and demand things and everything, but, but she had get, worked get the community. Yeah, and I think she had better contacts with yeah. the police and the community. But that's why Tilly is probably saying, you know, oh, she's a police informant. Go, she'll dob on any of you. So trying to have this this rivalry no, between I'm, them. I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for Kate so far. Mm. Uh, they would have several run-ins, uh, that, that Virgin comedic as well. Yes, sometimes the gangs and the men and everything cross paths and there'd be bloody, bloody battles. And it was, it was horrible. But if they met each other, you know, harsh words would be exchanged. A very famous exchange that happened in front of a uh, policewoman who was in the first few weeks of her beat and was talking to Kate Lee in the street. A tram passed by and Tilly literally jumped off the tram and punched Kate Lee in the face (laughs) and then sat on her. Nice. In the middle of the street. She's not subtle, that woman. No, no, (laughs) no, no. So that happened. Okay. As I said, they tried to discredit each other in the press. They worked with journalists who were sent out to cover these crime bosses because this was in the paper every single day. Mm. You know, these names, oh my God, they're so famous. They wanted to spread nasty comments about it. It was Kate who called Tilly the worst woman in Sydney (laughs) because Kate had been given the moniker the worst woman in Sydney and she went, oh no, that belongs to Tilly Devine. uh, yeah. Tilly claimed that Kate was jealous of her and said that Kate couldn't have been a sex worker, something she always denied Kate did, because who would have wanted that old bag? Mm. Old Tilly. Whereas Kate used to dig at Tilly saying, you know, I can travel first class to America on any boat that I choose. And I always used her wealth against her. They would throw bottles at each other in the street. They would spit venomous remarks, um, even shot at each other. But there was never an injury. Uh, allegedly, allegedly, that some of these things get really blown I out of proportion. Well imagine. <laughs> but as I said, I use the Shakespeare analogy at the start. Mm. The gangs between them would fight each other, and there are riots that took place in Sydney that are still commemorated in the city. And there's there's almost too many to go into <laughs> with these two rival gangs clashing and violent, bloody attacks on each other over territory, over who was controlling what drug or what prostitute at that time, any of that. And if they gang if they got together 
they would have taken over Australia. Yeah, it's kind of... <laughs> they could have ruled could the have, world. Yeah, they could have ruled the world. And they did, they did move other gangsters, apparently, between groups, and they sort of yeah. bribe one who was working with the other ones to yeah. come over to me and want to do all of this and everything. If only they joined forces. Yeah. They were both incredibly wealthy, but their money had to be spent on a lot of bribes and a lot of fines. Yeah. More laws were passed in Sydney in 1930 and later on to crack down on the crimes that they had tried to just swell yeah. earlier on. Went, okay, right, none of these worked none of these worked so they passed a law which is kind of crazy really where they went if you have seen speaking to a criminal then you're going to jail okay it's a roundabout Bold. way if, if you associate with yeah. anyone involved in the criminal underworld whoever that is then you're guilty too there were various criminal charges that were laid at their door that did actually take hold as well Kate was given a short jail sentence in the 1930s for habitually consorting with women of ill repute Okay. And being in a house frequented by thieves. Oh, Kate, at one point, in 1943 it was, police found 1,001 bottles of beer, 84 bottles of whiskey, and one bottle of gin underneath her floorboards of her house. Christ. How big, old house. big was her house? <laughs> what the hell? She also reportedly became friends with an old lady in jail. She got in a jail sentence for cocaine, I believe, possession. I was supposed to get two years. Paid off to say, I'll only serve one year. <laughs> Paid off the second year good friends with this old lady and they were like best friends and as soon as she got out of jail she robbed the old lady oh god <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah screw you both just women- remind me sorry i'm gonna interrupt you you know um well, ages and ages and ages and ages and ages ago mm. we did an episode on the the shark in sydney yes 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 so that, the, that the was arm. yeah that was 1935 yeah um, in Sydney and all <gasps> gang related in Sydney so <gasps> probably there must have been some sort of overlap oh, it just reminded me of like 30s 30s Sydney and I'm thinking we've done something in 30 cities before and this has just come to me like oh there's a big there was a shark oh I never thought <laughs> to look up the names there may be some um, names that match up so there, there may so well be some of, overlap yeah, going there on there yeah there were loads of men who had mentioned that they all worked <laughs> yeah. with and stuff like that oh well, I'll have to go back <laughs> and double check it yeah. but as we go through the 30s and 40s uh, the crime empire continues uh, both women are married several times I'm not going to go through all of the marriages in there because you know they get married and they get divorced and everything Tilly divorces Jim Divine very yeah. public divorce trial as well uh, the, the judge wasn't going to let her divorce him on the grounds of abuse even though it was so obvious he was like you need to have a witness in to say that you've been abused which is horrific and she paid someone to come in and go yeah he beat her up and the judge went okay fine you divorce (laughs) Uh, when uh, Tilly remarried she had this lovely wedding party and on her wedding night when they're getting down to it a bunch of fire engines and an undertaker's hearse turned up at her house (laughs) And many people think it was Kate. Brilliant. <laughs> you called oh, them in. brilliant. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm loving Kate, I have to say. <laughs> Tilly was furious in her silk pajamas opening the door. <laughs> Fantastic. So just this, all this bitterness and this rivalry. But business would then start to decline in the 50s, in the late 40s, early 50s, and into the 60s as well. Hotels started to open late again. And eventually the 6 p.m., opening time was lifted that's a long old stretch it's a though. long time that's like it 40 is a odd long years time yeah for first, well, 30 yeah. 40 years that they... it wasn't until the 60s i think it was finally like let just yeah. throw it out but then that just dwindles the services mm. they're getting on in years as well and they've also whittled away their fortunes well, you know yeah. they were so rich but they're having to pay so many fines and bribes and they're convicted again and again and again yeah. and again and they're always on petty stuff never for murder Never for anything big that will put them behind bars for ages. It's just small things that they can do. That's just eating away at all their their fortune. It's just yeah. You know, on these, yeah. Um, Tilly still managed to enjoy a very lavish 50th birthday party. <laughs> at the Talk of the Town newspaper in 1951 reported that guests enjoyed suckling pig, turkey, um, vintage champagne, and that Tilly received diamonds, orchids, and monogrammed lingerie from her guests. Oh, monogram! Who the hell needs monogrammed lingerie? <laughs> yes, who's going to forget that these are my pants? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the the, the, the the does the gifty put their own monogram on them? Oh, oh, that's <laughs> weird. <laughs> so just, I don't know. It's like who needs a monogrammed pants well it was quite a fashion at the time and like this? these are my this is my lingerie it's my lingerie it's got my name on it you're missing out clearly oh, indeed. No, you need to be indeed. monogramming all your a, pants i need to monogram my pants <laughs> ultimately they would both be undone by the greatest poison of them all nick greed the tax man oh 
Yes. Greed. <laughs> tax man, a second, close second. They were both stung for income tax. Oh. At different times, the wealth they loved to show off. Uh, Kate was declared bankrupt in 1954 for unpaid income tax. Tilly, in 1953, had foolishly remarked to the media, like again, showing off yeah. Tilly, brash lady. I'm a lucky, lucky girl. I have more diamonds than the Queen of England's stowaways and better ones too. So the taxman sent her a bill. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, really? Do you? Do probably you? probably on, on instruction of the Queen of England. Probably. <laughs> Ew. Old Liz there going, I don't fucking think you do. <laughs> yes, fuck her. <laughs> My first act as queen. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that bitch. <laughs> the women in their later life were known to give very generously to charity. They they held parties. They they were trying to be really active in the community. Maybe and some people try and go like, were they trying to make up for their criminal ways in the past? Nah. But you know, they were actively part of the community from the start. They'd curry favour with yeah. various people and Curry favour. Yeah. But both died pretty much penniless. Yeah. Um, Kate it's an expensive thing, these wars. They are. They are. Kate died after a stroke in 1964, aged 82. Apparently about 700 people attended her funeral. Pretty good, damn good going. For a- Some people said there were less, but one person who was present was Tilly. Uh, well, you would pay respect to a worthy rival, mm. a worthy adversary, I feel. Because at the end of their lives, the women apparently buried the hatchet. Yeah. They were photographed together. And they sort of had a mutual grudging respect and a sort of, not really a friendship, but they put their rivalry behind them. Um, I don't know why, but I've got Peggy Mitchell and Pat Butcher in my head. (laughs) (laughs) You bitch! You cow! I love you! (laughs) Pretty much. Let's just have them as the picture for this. Not that I've watched these for 20 years. (laughs) But but that was it. it. Bang on trend. That's what you are, mate. Apparently, Kate said in the end, Tills is a very good woman, mind you, no matter what the police say about her. Tilly attended Kate's funeral, but she would say when people asked her, she was only there to snoop. No, I think there would there would have been a grudging respect there, I think, absolutely. Tilly died of cancer aged 70 in 1970. In her lifetime, Kate had received 107 criminal convictions and served 13 jail terms. Tilly, 204 convictions to well her name, her. and went to jail between... 25 and 30 times those numbers are debated because who knows who knows really but that is the story of tilly divine and kate lee oh that's very good <laughs> that's very 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 good like they are great women aren't oh, they? brilliant absolutely brilliant mad story to research to be honest it <laughs> took a long time and reading various books that I'll put into the notes of this episode as well, listening to interviews and all I sorts of things. There's a lot out there about this. But. Well, th- there's a lot and there isn't. In Australia, I know there's been series made about them. Mm. I think there was one called Razor or Underbelly or Underworld or something like that. And, and please, Australian listeners, jump mm-hmm. on the comments of um, social media and tell us where we can access them because they have been covered and I think if anyone's seen that series I've not seen it but I've seen a still like a picture of it and it's portraying both of them as very glamorous gangster moles and they really did not look like that (laughs) at all (laughs) no so I think they've been covered in Australia um, and dramatized and some great books but really over here you would think these women need more press absolutely you know they did reprehensible things they did awful things they shouldn't be celebrated necessarily but in terms of all of the famous crime stories that we've covered this is kind of great this is yeah <laughs> they're up there yeah absolutely yeah it's a damn good story a lot of folklore and it's nice to see two women rise to the well, top quite absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, can, you can just imagine also all the the other gangs from yeah melbourne and Perth, or I, I'm trying to think of Australian places. Well, Melbourne um, closer to Sydney. Yeah. Perth, Mel- is, a Perth is a long way. Perth is a long way. It's lovely, uh, but you Perth, know. Yeah, from other places. Go, oh, it's Sydney. It's just, it's just a bunch of women yeah. in Sydney. We're going to take go and take over Sydney, and then again they're going. Oh no 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 no! no, no. We've taken up a bit too much here. <laughs> there was a there was a criminal named Norman Brun Brun, who came to Sydney from from melbourne and he was yeah he was the guy he was part of this criminal network he'd had to leave melbourne he'd hooked up with loads of different uh criminals in sydney and he was determined he was gonna take over them and mm. he threatened both of them apparently he came to them and said if you don't pay us protection money <laughs> i've decided yeah uh, we're gonna burn down your your businesses and he was killed by a hitman that worked for both women yeah 
at different time he was gunned down in the street as a symbol of like do not mess with Just us and the other criminals went okay we're leaving yeah, we're, we're leaving <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah I mean, yeah respect for them for coming up well, carving out a business carving out a business absolutely reprehensible what they yeah. did yeah. yes <laughs> tilly a bit more yeah, I've, you like I've, Kate more. Don't like, you, you do. I do like Kate more. You do like Kate more. Tilly again, very much in control of her own narrative. Yeah, it was very I, brash and very like loud. A young upstarty sort of vibe. From it's very nice to be betrayed as a nice madam who looks after everyone and gives them healthcare and medicine and everything. But if you cross them, then you're going to get slashed up. Mm, that's trafficking. Yeah. Uh, it's business there it's business it's business it's, where is Kate let's get drunk and high <laughs> still it was illegal but she was like ah screw it ah go for it screw it so I don't know if they were serving grog but it was called <laughs> Sly Grog Sly Grog there we are excellent so I promise you next time I mention grog there will be more pirates brilliant <laughs> pirates probably frequented well I could imagine Sydney. so yeah. there we are absolutely old ones who've been lost at sea for hundreds of years <laughs> sailed in we've been in a time loop <laughs> Well, there you go. That is the story of Kate and Tilly. What do you think, people? Do you know this story? Our lovely Australian listeners, please weigh in with more folklore or more stories about Kate and Tilly. Is there more to this story? Had you heard of this story? What do you think of the two women, criminal crime bosses? Are there more female crime bosses that we should be covering and delving into? And what do you think about turning up to court and just peeling some vegetables while you're listening to court <laughs> cases. Because <laughs> that's like, good energy. Yeah, I was. I was like, I was she's, she's productive while she's there. Yeah. She's there watching that, but also I'm going to peel some spuds. Yeah, and shout at people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and fabulous hats. Yeah. And lots of diamond rings on each Brilliant. hand. And, and every single finger diamond rings. Because that shows that you're wealthy, Absolutely. by the way. <laughs> and also it impacts nicely someone's jaw. <laughs> oh, no. Tell us what you think. Jump on the comments of this episode and tell us your thoughts, your theories, your musings, and more information that you have it on this story. But most importantly, while listening, you've got to mix yourself up some grog. Get some grog. Get, Get some, some grog. Get some grog down you. And then go to war and fire a cannon. <laughs> If you can. Go and sail the high seas. Cannon. <laughs> Only girls fight with swords. <laughs> Excellent Blackadder reference. We definitely need to do more high seas adventures. We need some more pirate adventures. Yeah. I'm so sorry this didn't have pirates, but I think I made up for it <laughs> with these two bitches. The, the groggy recipe will be out on Friday. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's an early daiquiri. Oh my god, it is! <laughs> shall we, shall Why we have say? we only just figured that out at the end of this episode? It's a freaking daiquiri. <laughs> but it's very tasty. It's very, very tasty. So if you have scurvy, if you mix have scurvy, one up. If you don't have scurvy, then what are you doing in your life, really? Mm, yeah, yeah. Mix one up because they are delicious. And send us pictures and suggestions of cocktails that we can have on the show and cocktails that you are enjoying because we like to know what you're drinking. Do join us on Patreon if you haven't already. And please, please, if you're new to the show, leave us a review on Apple iTunes because it massively helps our podcast and any other podcast you listen to, make sure you give them a review. Five stars if you can. If it's lower than that, just chat to us. Let's see what we can do about that. Yes, <laughs> just talk to us first. Talk to us. Follow us on Instagram, on TikTok where we do extra videos as well. And always drop us a message if you feel like it. Come and say hi. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.